Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you all for coming. I would like to tell you um, the story of the greater United States. And uh, I will start by telling you one thing you absolutely already know about US history. There are about three dates that people in this country, historical dates, know from memory. July 4th, signing of the Declaration of Independence, the uh, attacks on September 11th, and the other one is December 7th, 1941, the date that shall live in infamy. Uh, the date when Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Uh, this is a big part of national mythology. This is uh, an event that has been uh, written about at extraordinary length. There are hundreds of books about it. Uh, there are movies about it, uh, classics like From Here to Eternity, not so classics like uh, Pearl Harbor starring Ben Affleck. Um, but what those movies often don't show and what we don't always talk about is what happened next. Uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor by Japan wasn't just an attack on Pearl Harbor. It was part of a much larger attempt by Japan to attack the United States and British empires in the, uh, in the Pacific. So uh, it starts, uh, or at least it starts for the United States, uh, with an attack uh, on Hawaii. But it also uh, extends to, and this is all happening within a matter of hours, Wake Island, which is an uh, uninhabited but occupied uh, island uh, possessed by the United States, Guam, which was also, like Hawaii, a US territory, and the Philippines, which was in fact the largest territory, overseas territory, that the United States uh, had ever held. It also attacked the British territories of Hong Kong and Malaya, as well as the independent kingdom of Thailand. The Philippines is particularly important in this um, because militarily, the attack on the Philippines was, according to the Army's official history, just as bad as the attack uh, at Hawaii on Pearl Harbor. Uh, it took out the uh, backbone of, uh, you, uh, of allied air defense in the Pacific uh, just in a, in, in, in a single moment. And there's another interesting thing to mention about the attack on the Philippines. Unlike the attack on Hawaii, uh, which was just that, it was an attack. The Japanese attacked, they did not re-attack, and, and, and then you know, the sort of US licked its wounds and, and went back to war, uh, and, and, and went to war. Uh, the attack on the Philippines was an attack that was followed up by more attacks, that was followed by invasion, and that was followed ultimately by Japan's occupation of the Philippines, of this large archipelago uh, that was the largest US territory. And it wasn't really clear at the moment what to call this, how to refer to this. Uh, we have a term for it. Pearl Harbor, uh, but that term actually didn't emerge until a couple days after. That's when the first newspaper referred to it, to this attack as Pearl Harbor. So uh, you imagine a lot of people sort of scratching their heads as they're trying to figure out how to narrate what had just happened. Eleanor Roosevelt gave a speech before her husband FDR's speech in which she says, this is an attack on our citizens in the Philippines and Hawaii. That's what happened. It was an attack on the Philippines and Hawaii. Uh, Sumner Wells, FDR's trusted undersecretary of state, drafted the date which will live in infamy speech, or the speech that became that, uh, and he also used that locution. It's an attack on Hawaii and the Philippines, naming these two locations the place where the United States had been damaged the most militarily as the things to focus on. Uh, FDR rejected that speech, uh, and he typed up his own one, or he had typed up his own one, and we actually have the, the type scripts, we have the drafts of FDR's speech and we see what was typed up and then we see him sort of noodling with it, making edits on the fly throughout the day as he's getting more information, as he's thinking about how to talk about this. So one edit, you'll see at the top, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in world history was how it was initially described. Cross that out, instead added infamy, a good edit. Uh, but he did some other edits too. Uh, one edit that he did is that he crossed out prominent references to the Philippines. So an attack, his initial draft, like Eleanor Roosevelt's draft, like Sumner Wells' draft, was, made this an attack on Hawaii and the Philippines. And he crossed that out. And he became an attack on 
Hawaii. You can see this in the seventh line uh, of the speech behind me. Uh, it became an attack on Hawaii alone. Uh, there is a back part, a sort of neglected back part of the speech where FDR lists the other targets, uh, but it's an indiscriminate list. It includes uh, foreign and domestic, British and US and Thai targets all together without any real sense of which is which. So the Philippines was still there, but nevertheless he had crossed it out from the main description. Which leads to a question, why? Uh, we don't know, but it's really not hard for me as a historian to guess. Uh, FDR, I suspect, I strongly suspect, was reacting to the concern or had a worry that maybe people in his audience, the people that he was trying to rally to war, maybe when they heard about an attack on the Philippines, they wouldn't hear that as an attack on the United States. They would think about the Philippines and think, okay, who cares? In fact, we have opinion polls from right before the attack where people in the United States are asked if they would support a military defense of the far western territories of the United States, uh, uh, the Philippines and Guam, and the numbers are pretty low. In fact, the numbers on Hawaii, also a territory, not a state, were pretty low. In 1940, Fortune magazine gave its readers a survey and asked them, which countries should the United States defend if it comes to war? 55% said they would support a defense of Hawaii. Officials in Hawaii had two reactions, two very strong reactions to this. Uh, reaction one, 55%? That's a very low number. That's an alarmingly low number. And the second reaction they had, and they voiced it in irate letters to the editors of Fortune, which I have had the fortune to gaze upon, uh, the second reaction they had was, countries? Countries? Hawaii is not a country. Hawaii is an integral part of the United States, as integral as New York. And the fact that you're even referring to it as a country is setting us up for this baleful result, they said to the editors of Fortune. Uh, it seems like FDR had this on his mind as well. Remember, Hawaii is a territory, not a state at this time. Uh, it has a larger white population than the Philippines or Guam, but nevertheless, it has a minority white population. And it seems like FDR was a little worried about Hawaii itself, so he made one final edit to the speech. He made it between the last written and marked up draft that we have and the speech that he actually gave, so we can imagine him sort of just making it on the fly. Instead of referring to Japan attacking the island of Oahu, which is the place where it happened, he referred to Japan attacking the American island of Oahu, inserting the word American in there to underscore this really important point that FDR is trying to establish, which is the Empire of Japan has attacked the United States of America. Even after that speech, a classic of uh, national oratory, even after that speech, it could be a little confusing. Uh, FDR enjoins uh, people to follow the war in atlases, follow, get out your maps, li you know, listen to the fireside chats, and follow the war. Um, and there were a number of atlases printed during the war, wartime atlases that were ex explicitly designed to help citizens make sense of this global war. Uh, this is one, Rand McNally's wartime ready reference atlas of the world. Uh, and uh, I have an account of a uh, group of seventh grade girls in Kalamazoo, Michigan, who were doing what the president asked and were following along on their atlases. And when they did, they turned to this back page of the atlas, a list of foreign cities and places, and they noticed something. They noticed that in this list of foreign places was Hawaii, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. And they thought, this makes absolutely no sense. How can Japan have attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor if Hawaii is foreign, if Hawaii is not part of the United States. And God bless their teacher, they wrote to Rand McNally to ask. They wrote to Rand McNally and demanded an answer. And Rand McNally wrote back. So this is what it looks like when Rand McNally is trying to explain to a classroom of seventh grade girls in Kalamazoo, Michigan, why Hawaii is foreign. Although Hawaii belongs to the United States, it is not an integral part of this country. It is foreign to our continental shores and therefore cannot logically be shown in the United States proper index. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what that means and I don't think the seventh grade girls of Kalamazoo, Michigan knew what it meant either because they wrote back 
to say, we believe this statement is not true. <laughs> it is an alibi instead of an explanation. And they forwarded their entire correspondence to the Secretary of the Interior and asked for adjudication. And the Department of Interior wrote back and said, yes, of course, the seventh grade girls are entirely right. Hawaii is part of the United States. Look. What these stories about FDR, about the girls, are getting at is, is a confusion, a confusion that uh, sort of dogged the country at the time and, and still does to some degree today. Uh, it was a confusion about what the United States looks like. A ma just call to mind in your head, like, a map of the United States, what that, how you would map it in your head. My guess is that your map might look the way the map surely looked to a lot of people at the time of Pearl Harbor. Your map might look like this. These are the familiar borders. The uh, political scientist Benedict Anderson referred to this as the logo map of the United States, meaning that you know, if the country had a logo, this might not be a bad candidate for it. Um, here's the thing. These borders that are so familiar, uh, these were only the borders of the United States for three years of its history. There are three years of US history where that's an accurate picture of the country, partly because before the 19th century, the United States was much smaller. It grew, it expanded through a series of uh, uh, purchases and, and wars and conquests and indigenous dispossession. Uh, the United States finally expanded up until 1854, the Gadsden Purchase, uh, where it ac acquired the, 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 last, the sort of bottom uh, uh, in the West. Uh, it finally uh, grew into uh, the familiar profile that we know today by 1854. What we talk about less is what happens next. Because three years after that, the United States started doing something else, which is it started expanding overseas. First, taking uh, some uninhabited Caribbean and Pacific islands. Then in 1867, Alaska. In 1898, uh, in getting involved in a war with Spain and taking a number of colonies there. I'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, I wanted to make my own map of the country. And I wanted to make a map of the country on the eve of Pearl Harbor that I could not find in any of the archives I looked in. I wanted to make a map that showed the full United States. And not only that showed the full United States, that showed the full United States, the whole thing, all the area over which the stars and stripes flow. Uh, I wanted to show the whole area at the proper size. So with each part of the United States shown in equal size so that you could really get a sense of scope, I made that map. And this is what it looks like. You can still see that familiar shape. It's there, it's obvious, it's large. Uh, but what you see is that that's not the whole of the thing. That is, as some people in the territories often call it, the mainlands. It's part of the United States. It's a large and privileged part of the country, but it is not the whole of the country. In fact, Alaska is enormous. Alaska, if you were to stretch it over the mainland, would stretch from coast to coast. That's also true of Hawaii. Uh, not just the eight main islands, but the entire chain. If you were to move that up uh, to the mainland, that would also stretch almost from coast to coast. Uh, here you see the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines, American Samoa, uh, and Guam. And then I've shown uh, just on the bottom left and bottom right uh, the uninhabited islands that the United States claims. These are the only ones I've shown not to scale. Uh, they're so small that were I to show them to scale, they would be invisible. But I wanted them there to give you a sense of the extent of US possessions. And it's not really just about land size and space. A lot of people lived in these other parts of the United States. Um, this is the census count uh, from right before Pearl Harbor from 1940, uh, showing you how many people lived in the parts of the United States beyond the mainland. I won't go through every one, but I just want to give you a sense of the scope here. First of all, the Philippines is really populous, and that's important to recognize. Although it is not the only populous colony, and if you add them all up, what you realize is that the United States and its territories had nearly 19 million people. And for some sense of perspective, that means that if you lived in the United States on the eve of Pearl Harbor, the full thing, not just the mainland. If you live somewhere in the United States, there is a one in eight chance that you don't live on the mainland. There are so many colonized people who are part of the polity, who live in the United States, but not in the states, not on the mainlands, that if you live in the United States on the eve of Pearl Harbor, you are more likely to be colonized than you are to be African American, by odds of three to two. There are so many, that's how many colonized people there are in the United States. There are so many colonized people in the United States that if you live here 
uh, on the eve of Pearl Harbor, you are more likely to be colonized than you are to be an immigrant. That's how many colonized people there are in the United States. And that's kind of what my book is about. So I just published this book called How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States. And my goal in writing this book, this is what I wanted to do, was to write a history of the United States that wasn't just a history of the mainland. That was a history of the whole thing, what some people at the turn of the century called the greater United States. So a history that would include overseas territories, uh, that would include occupied lands, and that would include, going uh, more toward the present, uh, the hundreds of military bases over which the United States claims jurisdiction, the small enclaves that nevertheless are really an important part of US power and US history. And what I want to do today is give you a preview of this book. So, what, so the, the claim is methodological, and the claim is if you really want to study the history of the United States, if you want to understand it, you can't just look at the mainland. You've got to look at the whole thing. You have to look at the greater United States. Uh, and I want to sort of, you know, so I, I, the book goes through you know, 22 riveting chapters, uh, you know, just, just talking about different aspects of US history that look different once you've got a different unit of analysis. And I want to give you a sense of that, not by summarizing the entire book, but just by talking about three moments that I think become really interesting and become different once you've got the greater United States in view. Uh, and the first moment I want to start with is the moment that, if you read a US history textbook or taken a US history class lately, is probably the one moment when you do think about Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, Hawaii, and the Philippines. Uh, and that is 1898, when the United States fights a war with Spain. Spain is already in the middle of a sort of colonial crisis. It's already fighting a war with, uh, you know, within its empire against Cubans, against Filipinos, to a lesser degree against Puerto Ricans, to try to maintain imperial control. While Spain is enduring this colonial crisis, which looks like it's going to break the Spanish empire apart, the United States enters in at the very end on the side of the rebels and uh, participates in the sort of decimation of Spain's empire uh, in the New World and in, uh, uh, in the Pacific and ends up claiming, not all, but some of the Spanish territories, the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico. And then in a sort of imperial shopping spree, why not? It goes on in a very short period of time to also take uh, uh, the Hawaii and to take American Samoa, the non-Spanish lands. Um, what I want to remark about, what I want to point out right now, is that uh, this was not just a big deal for Puerto Ricans, Filipinos, Guamanians, etc. This was also a big deal for mainlanders uh, who started to see their country differently. They felt like this was a big moment in their history, a moment when the United States had sort of grown to maturity on the world stage, had joined the Imperial Club, and one way that they had of conveying that was that there was a lot of interest in remapping the country, in depicting the country differently. Uh, so here's, I'm going to show you a map that's a fairly common map that you might see around 1899 or eight, over 1900, a map of the country. I want to draw your attention to two features of this map. One feature is, well, what do you see? You see the mainland. That's normal. But you also see a bunch of boxes, Alaska, the Philippines, American Samoa, Guam, et cetera, et cetera, down to Puerto Rico. When was the last, just think about this, when was the last time you saw a map of the United States that had Puerto Rico on it? That's a fairly, I mean, it's a kind of jarring thing to see. We're used to Alaska and Hawaii, which are states, uh, but it's, it's unusual to see a map of the United States that has Guam on it. Nevertheless, it was not unusual around 1900. There were a lot of maps like this. The front page map of the census was a map like this. The other feature of this map I want to draw your attention to is how it's organized. The main organizational principle of this map is not the one we're used to. It's not the state divisions. You can see them, but they're not highlighted. The main divisions here are the divisions of the, of the moments of US expansion. The original United States, uh, Florida, the Florida session, the Louisiana purchase, the Texas annexation, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to stress, this is not a novelty map. This is not a map that is designed just to show one theme, to show the theme of expansion. This is, as cartographers intended to be, the main map of the United States. And what these cartographers are arguing in highlighting these moments of expansion what they're arguing is that the United States is ultimately the kind of thing that expands. That's what you need to know about the United States. State divisions, fine. But what you really need to know is that this is a country that is expanding. See all these boxes at the bottom. 
You can also find maps that are a little more familiar uh, to our eye that have the state divisions, but also show in boxes uh, the territories. This is a map from the inside cover of a textbook, of a history textbook, uh, the inside front cover. So this is the main reference map for students. You want to look at the country? This is what the country looks like. Uh, there's also a, a different map in the back inside cover of this textbook from 1900. It looks like that. Kind of the same principle, but done differently. Here you see uh, the mainlands, uh, but, and then you see the greater United States spread out against the world. So the mainland, Alaska, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, American Samoa, some of these places are uh, fairly small, so they're underlined in pink. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not that easy to see, uh, especially if you're far away. But nevertheless, what you see what the cartographers are arguing. They're trying to sort of color in all the bits of the world that are now part of the United States. And it's not just cartographers who sense that the country's identity has shifted and it needs to be depicted or talked about in a new way. It's also writers. Writers had been used to referring to their country as the United States. Uh, but they had a thought around 1898 and 1899, is that really the best way to refer to the country, because that nickname, the United States, or that contraction of the full name, United States of America, that suggests a kind of description, right? It suggests that this is a union of states. And these writers wondered, is that really what this country is? Do we imagine that the Philippines is going to be a state? Do we imagine that Hawaii or Puerto Rico are going to be states? No, a lot of them imagined we do not imagine that. And we have to think of new ways of conceiving of this country and possibly new ways of naming it. So I'm, I'm going to show you a list now of uh, books, uh, of titles of the country that I've collected from uh, books. So all of these names appear in the titles of books or as parts of the titles of books. Uh, so what you see here are references to it uh, as the Greater Republic. This is what the historian Frederick Jackson Turner refer, uh, preferred. The Greater United States, that's the term I use. Oriental America, that's a book that's particularly focused on the Philippines. And I found seven books from this time uh, with or that contained the title Greater America. Uh, and this here is a, a poster from the Greater America Exposition, a colonial exposition in which the uh, new territories of the United States were shown off. You can see Uncle Sam here with his engorged globe belly just pointing uh, to the new parts of the country. Uh, these names, as you know, didn't catch on. We don't refer to the country as the greater republic today. Uh, but there is a nomenclatural shift that was enduring, uh, and it's this. So in the 19th century, uh, the most common way to refer to the country was as the United States. The full name is the United States of America. Most people called it the United States. Uh, there are also other ways to refer to it, such as uh, the Union or as the Republic. People did not, by and large, refer to it the way that we often hear it referred to as America. They, they talked about the people of the country sometimes as Americans. That was pretty common. But to actually refer to the country as America, that was markedly less common. You will hear it. It happens sometimes. Walt Whitman did it. Uh, but nevertheless, it's not that common. I went through this speech of sitting, the public speech of sitting presidents from the founding to 1898 looking for times when they unambiguously referred to their country, not to the Americas, but to their country as America, and I found that they did so 11 times. That's once every decade a president refers to the United States as America, and then left, right, and center, they're referring to it as one of these other terms. Uh, if you look at the patriotic songs that are sung about the country, uh, you can look through the lyrics of Yankee Doodle, Star Spangled Banner, my country, tis of thee, Dixie, et cetera, et cetera. And you will find none of these have the word America in their lyrics. It's actually an interesting thing. The Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem, does not refer to America anywhere in its lyrics. The term that they did use uh, was another literary term for the country, Columbia, as in the District of Columbia. So actually, some of the most sung anthems in the 19th century were Columbia, Hail Columbia, and Columbia, Gem of the Ocean. Um, this changed. This changed really quickly after the war with Spain, and it changed for all the reasons that writers were searching for other terms. Uh, the first president to take office after the war with Spain, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, used the word America in his first annual address, and then used it 
constantly. I found a two week period in which in separate speeches, Roosevelt used the word America more than every past president combined had used it. And after Roosevelt, it's off to the races. All the presidents who follow Roosevelt refer constantly to the country as America. And the anthems change too. Not just you know, Columbia, gem of the ocean, but God bless America, America the beautiful. America, a more capacious term that allows, you know, you can imagine that this is not just a union of states, this is something larger, this is something perhaps vaguer, but that's an example of how the imperial history sort of uh, made a mark, uh, made a mark on U.S. history. Um, that moment, that moment around 1898 was a moment of uh, imperial visibility. Uh, people in the mainland were deeply aware of uh, Hawaii and the Philippines and Puerto Rico at this time. Uh, but that started, they, those places started to slide out of view from the perspective of the mainlands. And the United States had a different kind of empire, an empire that it didn't really like to talk about very much. The title of my book is How to Hide an Empire. And from the perspective of the mainlander Washington, I think you find that it's actually hard to find references uh, to Puerto Rico, uh, uh, to, to the Philippines, to Guam. And I'll give you an example of that. Let's take Britain as a comparative case. Uh, Britain had an empire as well, a much larger empire, and it celebrated that empire openly. It had a holiday that started in the schools and that became an official holiday in 1916, and that holiday was called Empire Day. And students were asked to sort of gaze at the map on the wall, look at all the parts that had been colored in pink to denote that they were British possessions. Uh, sometimes they would dress in national costume for all of the colonies that Britain possessed. It was a big deal. You couldn't not know about empire uh, in Britain. The United States had a, a, a tantalizingly similar holiday. Also a patriotic holiday, also started in the schools, and also became official in exactly the same year, 1916, but the United States' patriotic holiday was different. It was called Flag Day. And it was about revering the nation, not the empire. Students celebrated it in the schools, but they celebrated it by gazing at the flag, not the map. And the flag has one star for every state, but no markers for the territories. Britain governed its empire publicly and proudly. Uh, from a set of imposing edifices. This uh, building contained uh, the Colonial Office and the India Office and Whitehall in London. You couldn't not notice it. I'm now going to show you uh, the dedicated building that the United States had uh, for colonial government in Washington. So this is the building out of which all the colonies were governed and, and people would see it when they would uh, walk by in Washington. There is no building. There is no such building. Uh, the United States governed its empire out of Washington in a series of shifting and ad hoc arrangements. Uh, Guam was you know, covered by the Navy. There was the uh, Bureau of Insular Affairs. I mean, just everything was kind of shifting around. And in 1949, uh, if you took everyone above the level of clerk uh, who worked in Washington governing the empire, you would have 10 people. There's 10 people in Washington whose job it is to govern the US empire. That's really different from the British case. And it mattered. It mattered a lot, uh, not just to what mainlanders knew about their own country. Uh, it mattered a lot uh, to, to the overseas parts of the United States. And it particularly mattered in the 1930s, when Washington displayed a decided lack of interest in shoring up defenses in its uh, uh, Pacific territories. People knew that a war with Japan was brewing that a war with Japan might be likely, and Washington thought about what it might do if Japan attacked in the Pacific and if Japan attacked its western territories, places like Hawaii, Guam, and the Philippines, and decided, at least with uh, relation to the Philippines and Guam, uh, that US strategy, the plan, would be that the United States would put up token defense, allow Japan to take these colonies, and then hopefully try to win them back. That was the plan, rather than to sort of successfully defend uh, in case of attack. So uh, during this time when there's sort of a build up to the war, uh, the United States does very little uh, and very late to uh, prepare its territories for war that other folks, uh, that pretty much everyone uh, consents might be coming. Uh, in fact, the biggest thing that the United States did do in the Pacific to prepare for war uh, was not to build up fortifications, but was rather to put the Philippines on the path road, on the path to independence. In the 1930s, uh, Congress voted to put the Philippines on a countdown clock 
to independence. Uh, so it would be a sort of a 10-year period, and once it elapsed, the colony would be independent. Uh, this was done not out of a desire to liberate Filipinos. This was quite clearly done uh, partly for economic reasons. Uh, the idea was to chuck the Philippines over the tariff wall so Filipino goods couldn't get tariff-free to the mainland. Uh, but also it was due to uh, relieve the United States of the burden of defending this vulnerable colony. Because the idea behind it was, if Japan attacks the Philippines and the Philippines is independent, Washington does not have to defend the Philippines. Um, just to give you some flavor of it, uh, the, the new government that was established uh, uh, as part of this arrangement was called the Commonwealth Government. And this man, Manuel Quezon, was elected the first Philippine president. Uh, he demanded, uh, as part of being elected the Philippine president of the Commonwealth, uh, that he receive a 21 gun salute upon, uh, be, upon being sworn in. Uh, fitting for heads of state. FDR refused and said, absolutely not. You may not have a 21 gun salute. You get a 19 gun <laughs> salute because you are not a head of state. Quezon then threatened war, threatened to boycott his own inauguration, and then ultimately went along with it, took 19 guns, but too few guns would be an enduring theme in the years that would come in Philippine history. Uh, because Japan did attack the Philippines, and Japan attacked the Philippines, invaded it, and, and occupied it very quickly. Philippine defenses were indeed extremely weak. Uh, and Quezon begged for aid. Uh, surely Washington, surely uh, the mainland, should come to the defense of this very large colony in which millions lived. Uh, but when he did that, he came up, a, he came up against a, a hard reality, which is that Washington had adopted a strategy for the war, a sort of uh, strategy that governed how it, how it would fight the war, a, a, a grand strategy for the war. Uh, and that strategy was referred to as the Europe First Strategy. The idea behind the Europe First Strategy was that there were two war theaters, the Pacific and Europe, uh, and Washington would prioritize Europe, prioritize it in sense of the fighting would end and, and sort of uh, be taken care of there first, Prioritize it also in the sense that this would be the priority for goods. This was the more important of the two theaters. And uh, so FDR would give speeches, speeches which were audible in the Philippines, thanks to radio, where he would talk about the great need to aid England. And think about this from a Philippine perspective. It's not hard to because we have, you know, you know archival evidence of what Filipinos thought about this. But think about this from the Filipino perspective. Aiding England? England is... A, a foreign country, and B, an empire. Why aid England over the Philippines, which is actually part of the United States? Manuel Quezon had this thought, and this is how he expressed it. I cannot stand this constant reference to England, to Europe. I am here and my people are here under the heels of a conqueror. How typically American to writhe in anguish at the fate of a distant cousin while a daughter is being raped in the back room. That's not just a metaphor. The Japanese occupation was brutal and it involved a lot of sexual violence. And this was happening around Quezon. He could see it. He was still in the Philippines at this time. He demanded independence. He said, OK, if you are not going to help, at least, FDR, at least let the Philippines have immediate independence. And then I, as a head of state, will be able to negotiate with Japan. Maybe the Philippines can become neutral and the Japan can sort of station its troops but can leave. At least we won't have to be an enemy of Japan. Um, and FDR responded, no, you cannot. The Philippines cannot negotiate with Japan. You are not a head of state. And the US flag, the stars and stripes, will be defended to the death. Those arousing words, they're also a fairly accurate prediction of what was going to happen next as a result of the Europe First strategy. Winston Churchill had a conversation with the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, who'd actually been a Governor General of the Philippines. Uh, and uh, he asked Stimson, look, we, the British, uh, we're thrilled about this Europe First strategy you have. Uh, but we just want to make sure, do you understand the consequences? Are you fully willing to bear the consequences of this. And here he was particularly thinking of the Philippines. And thinking also of the Philippines, Stimson replied, there are times when men have to die. There are times when men have to die. Yes, we are understand the uh, costs of the Europe First strategy. 
The Philippines will be a sacrifice zone. There are times when men have to die. Uh, the Philippines was occupied by Japan. Uh, it was a brutal occupation. Uh, the Philippine economy was sort of shunted into the uh, Japanese war machine, and when Filipinos resisted, uh, they were often uh, beaten, tortured, uh, beheaded, and there were just a lot of accounts of Japanese repressive massacres as Japan seeks legitimacy uh, in, in a country uh, while seeking to uh, sort of you know, uh, uh, claim all of its food, all of its good and goods, and whatever else it can get. Um, the United States did return to its western territories, to Guam and to the Philippines. Uh, it returned late, it took a while to get back, uh, but it did return. And the first hint of we, ha we have of what that would look like uh, is in Guam, when the United States came back to, as it put it, liberate Guam, or as you might also put it, to reconquer, uh, to make Guam no longer part of the Japanese empire, but to make it yet again part of the US empire. Uh, except that Japan had done something on Guam which the United States had failed to do. Japan had fortified Guam, had prepared it for this. So whereas the Japanese were able to take Guam in a single day, it took considerably more time uh, for the US armed forces to conquer Guam. Uh, it took two weeks of bombing and shelling from the shores uh, before the United States even uh, hit Guam on foot. It just sort of tried to soften Guam up, take out any military targets it could, uh, and in doing so, basically leveled many of Guam's structures. This is the capital city, Agana, now Hagatnya, um, completely leveled. In fact, in this process, four-fifths of the homes on Guam were destroyed, and the Japanese, now understanding that they were fighting a dead-end war, uh, began to turn on the Guamanian population, outright massacring many of them, beheading uh, hundreds, uh, or killing and hundreds, beheading many of them. Uh, it was really a brutal thing uh, for the Guamanian populace. And that was a kind of preview about what might happen next, because very shortly after, the United States came to take not the relatively small colony of Guam, but the much larger territory of the Philippines. It started the same way it started in Guam. A lot of the um, energy was concentrated on the capital city of the Philippines, Manila, which was at the time the sixth largest city in the United States. It had a million people in it. And the United States approached it much in the way that it approached the island of Guam by bombing, by bombing military targets. Of course, because the Japanese had fortified Manila. This is a pamphlet that I found in the archives in Manila that the uh, US had dropped over a number of Philippine cities. Uh, and it gives you some sense of the, you know, just the, what, what this tactic entailed. Filipinos, American planes are bombing and strafing this area. Remember, we don't want to hurt you, but bombs cannot tell friend from foe. Stay away from, and then it lists a series of military targets. Bombs cannot tell friend from foe. That was the problem with bombs. Uh, they can't tell friend from foe. So after the United States had taken out a number of military targets in Manila, and this kind of thing also happened in other cities, uh, it, it, it went to engage Japanese troops on the ground. And the Japanese were holed up in uh, buildings. They had uh, constructed pillboxes at intersection. This was going to be fighting that would have to happen block by block. And at first, the US Army, led by the uh, 37th Infantry Division, sought to do this the artisanal way, with small arms, going into the buildings, you know, getting in firefights with the Japanese. Uh, but pretty quickly, it became clear that this was a costly tactic, and that a number of mainlanders died this way. Of course, it's dangerous to have a firefight in a building. Uh, the number of mainlanders who died was, uh, from the perspective of the army, quite large, uh, but from the perspective of the larger carnage that was taking place in Manila at the time, quite small. It was Filipinos who were dying in large numbers rather than mainlanders. Nevertheless, the army decided, particularly the 37th Infantry Division, to switch tactics, to switch from the artisanal method to the industrial one, from small arms fire to just shelling any building that, uh, sus that it suspected to contain the enemy. So just, just taking out the entire building. Uh, as the uh, lead, uh, as the commander of the lead division put it, to me, the loss of a single American life to save a building was unthinkable. Which makes sense. I mean, if I had to weigh up the value of a life 
versus architecture, I wouldn't really hesitate. Save the life. Uh, but what, uh, what he didn't say, but what he absolutely knew, is that those buildings aren't just buildings. Those buildings are occupied. Those buildings are occupied ostensibly by Japanese, yes, but those buildings are also occupied by Filipinos. And if those buildings aren't occupied by Filipinos, often the buildings next door were. And sometimes the shells weren't so accurate. And this strategy of taking out the entire building, this strategy had a profound cost on Filipino lives. And I just wanted to say that before I show you a few of the photographs that I collected when I was in Manila, so you'll have a sense of what it means when you look at a photograph like this. Overall, the liberation of Manila took a month. And this strategy, take out the building, save the life, that did work for the lives of members of the US Armed Forces. Uh, overall, in this uh, month of carnage, about 1,000 members, 1,000 mainlanders died. But at that same time, in that same month, 100,000, we think, Filipinos died. This is Dresden. This is Warsaw. Manila is one of the sites of the sort of more extreme carnage in World War II. And this is not just happening in Manila. Manila is the largest city in which a tenth of its population dies in just a matter of a month. Uh, but this is, imagine this happening, or versions of this happening, up and down the archipelago. Uh, overall, World War II in the Philippines, according to the Philippine government's count, killed 1.1 million Filipinos. And many of those people died at the very end of the war, during the liberation of the Philippines. And a number of them died from friendly fire. Uh, if you add in Japanese deaths uh, and mainland deaths, but the Japanese deaths are far larger, uh, you get the entire figure for World War II deaths in the Philippines, 1.6 million. That's two civil wars. That's the bloodiest event that ever happened on US soil. That is, just from the pure statistical perspective, an enormous thing that happened in US history. And yet, when you look at most US history textbooks, it's hard to find evidence of this. You will often find this not mentioned at all, because US history textbooks tell you the history of the United States. And the United States, for those purposes, refers to the mainland. This happened on US soil, but not on the part of US soil that really counts when we often talk about US history. This, of all the photographs, is the one that haunts me the most. It's the picture and it's the look in her eyes. It's also the look in his eyes. Um, I found an account. I, I, I tell the story of the destruction of Manila in my book, and I reconstructed it from diaries that I was able to get um, from people who'd lived through it, many Filipino. And I found one diary from uh, uh, someone who'd been a boy at the time. His name is Oscar Villa de Lid, And he'd, he'd been a boy at the end of this. Um, and he'd encountered a GI walking through the wreckage, much as this one was, uh, handing out chocolate. And Oscar Villa de Lid accepted some chocolate from him and then said to him, thank you very much. And the GI looked at him and said, how do you speak English? And uh, Oscar Villa de Lid said, oh, uh, right. When you colonized us, uh, you sent over some teachers. Uh, and uh, we, they taught us English, and in fact, English is the language of instruction in Philippine schools, so I grew up speaking English. And the GI paused yet again, looked even more perplexed, and said, we colonized you? And Oscar Villadolid is like, I can't believe this. How does he not know? Because think about it from the GI's perspective. He's gone all the way across the Pacific, seen God knows what, been given a gun, been shown maps, been told whom to shoot, and at no point has it dawned on him that he's in US territory. He thought he was invading a foreign country. Um, the Philippines got its independence after World War II on schedule, July 4th, 1946. Uh, and it wasn't too long after that that Hawaii and Alaska also got, not independence, but a sort of decolonization of another kind. Uh, they became states, overcoming a lot of racist determination in Washington, in Congress especially, to keep them out of the Union because they were insufficiently white. Um, and this is part of a tilt 
in US history away from having a colonial empire, away from the kind of worlds uh, that had marked the 19th century and the early 20th century when you get more powerful, you, you get more territory, uh, to a different kind of footprint for US power. Uh, as the US distances, distances itself, not completely, but, but uh, substantially, from colonial empire and pursues a different shape of power, uh, what I call the pointillist empire. Uh, the United States still has inhabited territories, five of them, and millions of people live in them, Puerto Rico being the largest. Uh, but nevertheless, if you look at the United States today and you look at sort of all the places over which the stars and stripes fly on the map, what you see most prominently is not those places, but the hundreds of enclaves, that little tiny, small enclaves over, the which the over which the United States claims jurisdiction, military bases principally. These are the sort of bases uh, in, in both senses of US power today. And it's, you can sort of imagine uh, you know, the, the country standing before a map of the world, putting down the imperialist's paint roller and picking up the pointillist brush, just getting one, two, three, and, and uh, one, two, three, and uh, you know, a hundred or so. Uh, we think that overall the United States uh, has or has claim on 800 bases all over, sprinkled around, 800 foreign bases sprinkled around the planet. And in my book, I talk a lot about that. I talk a lot about what that means for the United States, and I talk about what that means for the world, what it means for people who have to live uh, near uh, these bases, in the shadow of these bases. But I want to end by talking not about the pointillist empire, but by talking about uh, an event in our more recent past that shows you the continued relevance of the colonial empire. And this is a moment that I think is sort of the proximate origins of our time, the moment when the politics as we know it really sort of uh, came into being. Uh, but we don't usually talk about it in terms of colonialism. It's the 2008 election. So bear with me here. This is how I see the 2008 election. The Republican contender seeking to be president is John McCain. John McCain wants to be president, and to be president, you have to be, according to the Constitution, a natural born citizen. The Constitution says that, but it's not actually clear what natural born citizen means because the Supreme Court has never clarified that. Uh, but nevertheless, legal experts think, and I think we could all understand why they think this, that to be a natural born citizen, you have to be a citizen when you're born. The moment you're born, you have to be covered by some citizenship law. Uh, the trick here, though, for John McCain is that he is not born on the US mainland. He is born in the Panama Canal Zone. He is a Zonian. He's born there. He doesn't grow up there, but he's born there, and it's on his rap sheet. And so I know what you're thinking. OK, well, uh, there's a law that says uh, if, your citizens are par if your parents are citizens, which John McCain's are, then you're a US citizen. Actually, there's not a single law that says that. And at the time John McCain is born, there is a law. But what the law says is if you are born outside the territory and jurisdiction of the United States to citizen parents, you're a citizen. But John McCain's not born outside the territory and jurisdiction of the United States. He's born in the Panama Canal Zone, which is absolutely under the jurisdiction of the United States. I know what you're thinking. Now you're going to say, OK, well, there's another law. It's called the 14th Amendment which says that if you're born in the United States, no matter who your parents are, you're a citizen. Aha. But there's also a Supreme Court ruling, which is still good law, which specifies that the Constitution doesn't actually apply to all of the United States. The Constitution applies to part of the United States. And the United States possesses an extra constitutional zone. Uh, the unincorporated territories are in that extra constitutional zone, and the, uh, c uh, the Constitution doesn't fully extend to them, and the 14th Amendment doesn't extend to them, which is why even today, if you are born in American Samoa, you are not automatically a US citizen. You are a US national. Because although you're born in American Samoa, the United States, uh, the 14th Amendment does not extend to you. So McCain is not covered by the Constitution. Well, uh, Congress at one point realizes this. And they're like, wow, people born to citizen parents in the Panama Canal Zone are made citizens by no law. Should they be citizens? And they have a debate. And there's both side, there are two sides to this debate. And Congress decides, no, 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 they should be citizens. And so it passes a law, and that law gets uh, signed. Uh, and, and the law says, OK, if you're born to citizen parents and you're born in the Panama Canal Zone, you're a citizen. And that law applies retroactively. So uh, anyone who was born uh, 
before this, uh, this uh, but in that condition, is also now a citizen. So that law is passed in 1937, and John McCain is born in 1936. So at, per the law, he's a citizen, but that law didn't take effect until a year after he was born. There was no law making him a citizen at the time of his birth. Arguably, John McCain was not a natural born citizen. Actually turned out to be not a huge deal for him. He's a war hero, he's white, he's from a military family. It, you know, it came up a little bit, but the full extent of the case never really got made in public. And anyway, it didn't seem like it was a big deal. But, Oddly enough, this is not the end of John McCain's empire woes, uh, because his running mate is Sarah Palin. Now, she's born on the mainland, but as a newborn, she uh, is moved to Alaska. And she grows up in Alaska, but by then a state. And she uh, uh, meets uh, an oil field worker there, uh, Todd Palin, falls in love, marries him, takes his name. Uh, and here's something we don't often talk about. Todd Palin is Yupik. Todd Palin is partly an Alaska native. Todd Palin is legally an Alaska native, and in fact, the Palin children are actually legally Alaska natives with all the claims and rights uh, that come with being an Alaska native. And this was, in fact, a thing that Sarah Palin talked about a lot. Here's Sarah Palin wearing the cuspuck, which is sort of uh, customary uh, Yupik garb. It's actually worn by a lot of folks in Alaska, not just folks who are Yupik. Uh, but here's her, you know, she's just kind of not just like wearing it at a ceremony, she's just kind of wearing it around to the grocery store as well. Um, oh, by the way, these are different. She has multiple. Um, so, uh, and she talked about them when she was running for governor. She, she, she proudly brought Todd's grandmother on stage with her and said, you know, who was a Yupik English translator and said, look, this is part of our family. The Palins are a mixed family, and that's a good thing for Alaska. So this was something that she was very proud of. It didn't come up a lot in the general election, but one related aspect of it came up. Todd Palin is not just an Alaska native. Todd Palin was also a member of the Alaskan Independence Party, a party that, uh, whose premise was that the vote for Alaska statehood, uh, the vote among Alaskans, was illegitimate. And that vote was illegitimate because Alaska natives, the indigenous people of Alaska, uh, who could not speak English, didn't get to vote, whereas military personnel from the mainland stationed in Alaska could vote. So the Alaskan Independence Party argued, there was never a legitimate vote making Alaska a state. There needs to be a new vote, and ideally that new vote would point toward Alaskan independence. So Todd Palin, for years, is member of a secessionist party. Sarah Palin is not a member, but she goes to party conventions with him. And when she's a governor, she delivers a uh, message of endorsement encouragement to the party. Basically, you know, you're doing great. Couldn't imagine Alaska without you. That seems like a big deal. Um, it, it doesn't end up uh, damaging Sarah Palin much. Again, she's white, and she's uh, a fierce defender of the real America, as she calls it. Uh, but these kind of issues do have a way of harming McCain and Palin's opponent in the general election, Barack Obama. Barack Obama is born slightly after Alaska, or after Hawaii becomes a state. Uh, so he doesn't have the McCain problem. He's born in a state. And although Hawaii also, like Alaska, has a substantial sovereignty movement, in fact, larger than Alaska's, Barack Obama doesn't politically engage with it. So he doesn't have the Palin problem. Nevertheless, he's a mixed race guy born on a Pacific island, and he has the kind of elaborately cosmopolitan family that is not unusual for folks in Hawaii. This is Barack Obama with his extended family. His arm is around his sister. Uh, there, his brother-in-law is, is, is the younger man uh, in, in the suit. Uh, and you can see in this extended family shot, elements of the family that are coming from all over, African-American, African, white, Chinese, Indonesian, Malaysian. This is the kind of family that's not too typical for the mainland, but is actually pretty common for Hawaii. And all of this, his birthplace, his family, his name, who he is, just makes Barack Obama seem to some people who you know, kind of witness him a little bit foreign. And that comes up in the 2008 election. It comes up in the primaries uh, when he's running against Hillary Clinton. Uh, Hillary Clinton's senior strategist, Mark Penn, prepares a memo for her about how to deal with Barack Obama. And he says, look, the thing about Obama is that he's born in the Pacific. He is not, says Mark Penn, 
fundamentally American. And Hillary Clinton, you should mention this in all your speeches. You can't mention it directly, but you should be, all your speeches should say something like, I was born in the middle of the century, in the middle of America. Because implicitly, Barack Obama cannot say that. He was not born in the middle of America. To her great credit, Hillary Clinton refused to take this strategy. She refused to run on this. Uh, but you can see in this moment that wobbliness about Hawaii, that question about is Hawaii really part of the United States, still percolating in people's brains. And percolate it did, because even after Clinton refused to take the bait on this one, uh, her supporters did. After she lost the primary, her supporters started circulating rumors and emails that Barack Obama was not a natural born citizen, and he should be disqualified, and Clinton should thereby have the nomination. These rumors started among Clinton supporters, but then switched party lines and became uh, even uh, more vicious among Republicans. Uh, and look, you know how the rumors go. The rumors are that Barack Obama was born in Kenya. And obviously, there's a lot of anti-black racism in these rumors, but I just want to draw your attention to something. There's been a lot of major black political figures before. It is, uncommon, it is an uncommon form of libel against them to claim that they are not born in the United States. What we are seeing in the case of Obama is a lot of anti-black racism, but inflected and directed and given shape by this other aspect of Obama, the fact of where he's from, not just what he looks like. This birther rumor dogs Obama throughout his presidency, and it becomes the entry point for another figure onto the political scene, Donald Trump. Donald Trump had run for president before, but it's this issue that launches him into the center of political debates. He threatens to write a book about it. He claims to have hired an investigator to get to the bottom of it. This is the thing. This is the first issue that makes uh, Donald Trump a viable presidential candidate. And I think at this moment, we can just sort of gasp and take a step back and just think about this. Obama, McCain, Palin, Trump, every one of these has in some really interesting way been touched by the persistence and the power of colonialism, by colonialism in US history. And for me, that's a really eloquent reminder that when we think about the United States, and when we think about its history, we can't just think about the mainland. We've got to think about the entire thing. We've got to think about the greater United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, I'll repeat what someone once said at a conference was, uh, that I was at once. Uh, your first sentence should be a question, and you shouldn't have a second sentence. Uh, so please, we, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. Uh, so please try to make your voice heard, and Daniel will uh, call on you. Uh, yes, in the back. Um, I was wondering if you can speak to the histories of resistance from the colonies of the United States in particular the Philippines and the National Democratic Movement that has, um, I think, laid out an, an amazing example of resistance to US imperialism and the greater US. Yeah. So this, this is a question that? about something I didn't talk about in this talk, about resistance. What does this look like from the point of view of the colonized? Um, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's something I talk about a good deal in the book, about uh, resistance movements, particularly in Puerto Rico and the Philippines. And a really important thing to get is that uh, these uh, uh, co overseas conquests of the United States uh, did, not, were not sort of, did not go down easily in the territories themselves. The United States fought a, uh, the second longest war in US history uh, to pacify the Philippines uh, right after taking it from Spain, a war that lasted 13 years and we think killed some three quarters of a million people, almost all Filipinos, mainly from disease. Uh, it's also really important to recognize that there's a serious history of Puerto Rican resistance to US empire. Uh, a story of resistance that has, and I talk about all this in the book, uh, that has uh, culminated at one point in 1950 in a seven city revolt, uh, an uprising that included an assassination attempt and a near successful one on Harry Truman. Uh, a, a resistance movement that uh, culminated in 1954 in a shooting in the House of Representatives in which five congressmen were shot by uh, Puerto Rican nationalists. This is a really important part of US history, and it's, it's a kind that just sort of uh, seeps to the margins uh, when we don't really have Puerto Rico in view. 
Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, yeah, so the, the book has a lot to say about uh, various moments in which um, colonial subjects has, have resisted U.S. empire. That's a big part of the history of the greater United States. In the back. So the question is, how much of this is imitating European empires? Uh, that's a great question. I think the answer is quite a lot. Uh, the, 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 even the title, the Greater United States, that has a reference to Great Britain and to this also project that uh, some British were pushing called Greater Britain. So uh, there's a you know, and the idea of like coloring in all your territories in the map. Um, that's also a way of emulating particularly Britain. Uh, a lot of the uh, most excited imperialists in the United States, people like Teddy Roosevelt, were talking to the British. And in fact, the most famous um, sort of poetic celebration of empire, uh, the poem White Man's Burden by Rudyard Kipling, was actually written as advice from the British to the United States to take up the white man's burden. And, uh, Teddy Roosevelt had an advanced copy of it and was quite happy to do exactly as Rudyard Kipling had suggested. Uh, so yeah, there's a long history of it. There's also an important difference, uh, which is that the United States, I think, had been sort of locked into this mode of what historians called settler colonialism, uh, not taking large and distant lands and ruling them, uh, but rather taking contiguous lands, uh, displacing indigenous people, and then filling them with white settlers. Uh, that is what it had done throughout the 19th century, and I think as a result of being so committed to that particular form of empire, uh, by the time it started really taking large populated overseas territories such as the Philippines, it encountered a kind of cognitive dissonance. Uh, and they never really became part of the political culture of the United States in the way that empire did in uh, the Netherlands, in, in, in France, in, in Britain, and, and in Japan, and other major empires. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about the U.S. empire in Liberia. This book is about um, U.S. territory. So in the, some, in the way that some journalists uh, follow the money, my slogan was follow the territory, uh, because you can often see quite a lot when you do. Uh, but that means that the book is restricted to moments where the United States has actually claimed jurisdiction. And there's a project in the 19th century uh, to, it's, it's, it's weird because it's a number of people who are participating in it, but the idea is to uh, set up a, a black settler colony in Africa, Liberia, uh, partly as a way to remove African Americans from the United States and sort of get them out of the country. Uh, but for some African Americans, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very exciting potential form of liberation. Um, I don't talk about it in the book. Um, and that's just a, a good reminder that although this book is about the territorial empire of the United States, Actually, there's a lot of other ways in which the United States does imperial projects. And there's a lot of things that we could talk about under the category of US empire. We could talk about uh, the sort of expansion of the dollar to become the global currency. We could talk about all the wars the United States has engaged in, in Asia, in Latin America. There's a lot of things that happen sort of under the title of empire uh, that aren't part of this. And in, in talking about the territory particularly, I'm not seeking to say that empire is only territory. Uh, it's just that, oh boy, it gets interesting when we look at the territory. Yes, sir. Uh, following up on the first question about resistance, um, before the uh, Philippine uh, ending or occupation there, or colonization there in 1946, what were the attitudes toward, of the Filipinos towards independence that they, that they wanted then, by and large, that they, uh, that also they need right today, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, and so forth, how do those people feel about independence? Yeah, so the question is particularly about how Filipinos in World War II felt about independence, but also how folks today feel about statehood, independence, other things. Um, these questions get really complicated and really interesting because they're not just questions about rights. They're not just questions about representation. They're not just questions about uh, tariffs. They're also questions about identity. And for that reason, they can get really heated and really complicated. Um, the Philippines around the time of its independence, 1946, is one example of the complications. A lot of Filipinos supported independence, and they voted for political candidates who promised independence. But at the same time, often those political candidates were uneasy about independence, were uneasy about being economically separate from the United States, were uneasy about being thrown over the tariff wall. And one really like, amazing example of this is uh, 
the Philippines, before it became officially independent, it, it set, sent its first delegation to the United Nations. So they were going to, even though it wasn't quite independent yet, they were going to represent the United Na uh, Philippines at the United Nations. And um, uh, someone asked them, like, as they like stepped off the plane, they asked them, uh, what do you think about statehood? And the delegation said, we would absolutely consider statehood if it were offered. And, you know, and suddenly, like, the Philippine, like, Commonwealth president is like, what, are you kidding? No, no, we're not talking about statehood. Uh, but it just shows you the kind of ambivalence. And there's, you know, and there were actually some people in Washington who were interested in talking about it. There were a number of major newspapers that came out right at this time for Philippine statehood uh, instead of independence. Um, the same kind of uh, ambiguities and complexities uh, and vacillations you, you can find today. Um, there's some really interesting questions that are coming up very publicly right now about Puerto Rican status. Should Puerto Rico be a state? And that's a question, I mean, uh, historically, these questions have been answered by Washington, right? Congress gets to decide. Uh, I think it's, it's well past time uh, that people in the territories themselves should decide status. Uh, but I can say that there's a, there's a real debate happening in Puerto Rico right now about whether statehood and further inclusion into the sort of U.S. empire uh, is preferable uh, than, uh, you know, the status quo, status quo with representation, or uh, as some would prefer, independence. If we, if we could get a bit into the, what you call the pointless empire, the 800 military bases, um, there are movements trying, trying to oppose those bases all over. I think people are hoping now over. Uh, they recently had a, a vote um, regarding a, 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 new, a new base in the construction, opposing that construction. 72% of the population were against it. What we hear practically nothing about that this from, from, from our media. It's not, it's just not debated. What, what, you know, how, how would you account for that apparent disinterest? Yeah, so this question is about uh, resistance, not resistance on behalf of people living in U.S. territories, but resistance of people who are living in the shadow of the basing empire. Uh, and you're right, there's a lot of that. And one thing I talk about in the book is uh, the fears and the protests that the bases have uh, historically um, generated. Uh, I mean, it's really hard to live in the shadow of a base, especially if that base has nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons which could accidentally go off, nuclear weapons which could cause that base to be a target in the case of war, uh, nuclear weapons that you know, could then you know, fire uh, from that base. Uh, so there's been a lot of protest to it, and I think you're absolutely right. You suggested that we don't always hear about that on the mainland, and I think that's correct. And the best example I have of this is that um, September 11th, after Osama bin Laden's attack, there was this question, why do they hate us, right? And the answer was usually had something to do with national character. They hate our freedoms, you often heard. Uh, Osama bin Laden had been pretty clear about his reasons, and he listed them, and he delivered, you know, he gave this message, message to Americans. Uh, he'd, he'd been uh, giving messages of this sort for a while. The main issue, not the, absolutely not the only issue, but the main issue that animated Osama bin Laden and the one that he returned to again and again throughout his career was the stationing of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia, in the land, the holy land, the land of Mecca and Medina. That to Osama bin Laden was the provocation. And the idea that after September 11th, there could be such confusion on the U.S. mainland about why this happened indicated that a lot of people, including in leadership, didn't really have a good understanding of the fact that the United States is not just a blob. It is this area that extends out all over the planet, and those little dots make a big difference. Uh, we have time for one more. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Could, could you say a little bit about whether the United States is a sui generis case, or like, are there other polities or states that you see that have also an empire hiding problem? Yeah, so is the, is the US the only place with an empire hiding problem? I think uh, it is. Uh, unusual in the extent of it. Uh, and the other way in which the United States is unusual is there are other countries that have had empires like the greater United States with Philippines, Puerto Rico, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, the United States modeled itself after those countries. The pointillist empire, that's unusual. The United States has hundreds of foreign military bases. If you take every other country and you add up all of their military bases, so like everyone else's military bases all over the world, you get about 30. 
So in that way, the United States is a very distinct animal, a very different kind of empire, uh, and whose uh, fate it will be our pleasure to uh, contemplate over the next couple of years.